Well, I'm very honored this evening to welcome to Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government and to this ARCO Public Affairs Forum, uh, Matsuo Fujioka, President of the Asia Development Bank. Mr. Fujioka is one of the most distinguished authorities and practitioners of international public finance and development. He's a law school graduate of the University of Tokyo, as indeed are a number of other students here at the school now, but he also studied finance and economics at the University of Chicago, unfortunately. <laughs> Mr. Fujioka has come here to Cambridge uh, directly from the IMF World Bank meetings in Washington, and we look uh, forward in particular to hearing his perspective on what's happened at those meetings over the last few days. I should say just a word about Mr. Fujioka's background. Prior to his current job, he served with Japan's Ministry of Finance and its Export-Import Bank, and also with the IMF. So he's had a wide range of experiences in areas such as economic development, co-financing, and multilateral development banking. Mr. Fujioka is well known and indeed has established a very distinguished reputation as one of the most aggressive and imaginative leaders in the international banking community, committed to economic development in Asia and the Pacific region, an area which has been uh, markedly successful in this regard. The topic of Mr. Fujioka's remarks tonight is Asia and the world economy recovery and interdependence. After his remarks, I'll introduce our distinguished panel who will offer comments and responses, and then there'll be questions from the audience. So it's a great honor to welcome tonight Mr. Fujioka. Thank you very much for your very kind introduction about me. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, Mr. Chairman, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, I am greatly honored by your invitation to appear as lead panelist in a discussion at this renowned School of Government with such prominent members of the Harvard faculty. I have been asked to discuss the broad topic of Asia and the world economy, recovery and interdependence. In doing so, I will touch on the major north-south issues as they relate to developing Asia. First, I will discuss the importance of interdependence between developed and developing nations in achieving sustained world recovery. I would then like to comment on the very worrisome issues of external debt and protectionism. Finally, I will point out the importance of the role of development aid and the Asian Development Bank in the Asia and the Pacific region. Interdependence between economic growth in developing Asia and the industrialized countries, especially the United States and Japan, is more significant now than at any time in the past. Whether this reliance will lead to prosperity in both North and South in the wake of world economic recovery will depend critically on the policy responses of the countries concerned. In the course of my remarks, therefore, I would like to comment on the recent features of the international economy that I fear may inhibit the mutual prosperity of North and South. In the past few months, leading economic indicators in the United States have turned decidedly positive and provide the basis for optimism that recovery in the United States will gradually spread to other parts of the world. The economic picture in some OECD countries has improved somewhat in past weeks. There is, in fact, some apprehension that too rapid a rate of recovery might rekindle inflation, put pressure on interest rates, and choke off recovery prematurely. 
My assumption here is that financial and economic managers in the major industrialized countries are fully aware of these dangers and will steer the international economy away from them. My apprehension is rather whether U.S. recovery will indeed lead to worldwide recovery. The many unknowns surrounding the extent of economic recovery arise from the fact that unlike recoveries from earlier recessions, the current economic recovery may not be transmitted smoothly. In the past, a resumption of growth in the industrialized economies spread fairly quickly to the developing nations. Compared to past recoveries, however, this one begins from a base of relatively higher unemployment and interest rates and unused capacity in the industrialized countries. By many assessments, these factors will tend to slow the spread of recovery to the developing world. More importantly, the depth and the duration of the recession have caused some far-reaching structural shifts in the national versus international economic balance, which may constrain the movement of recovery from the industrialized countries to the developing ones. Such restructuring includes an unprecedented burden of developing country external debt, the emergence of new protectionism in industrialized markets, and increasing aid fatigue in developed countries. These are some of the major subjects being taken up by North-South Dialogue. They are, in many ways, a legacy of the turbulent 1970s, but they will most likely endure throughout this decade. Earlier this year, major North-South issues were addressed by the Williamsburg Summit and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Belgrade, which focused on the specific issues of accumulated debt, trade, primary communities, the international monetary system, and official development assistance. There is widespread disappointment that these meetings did not produce any tangible results. But it is quite understandable that long-standing issues between developed and developing nations have remained unresolved. The world economic environment has hardly been conducive to the resolution of such deep-rooted and sensitive issues. But the absence of acrimony in these discussions, in contrast with that of the early 1970s, reflects realism on both sides to seek common ground rather than confrontation. It also reflects the fact that the South itself is now divided into different country groupings with varying concerns and priorities based on their stage of development, such as the newly industrializing countries, or so-called NICs, and quasi NICs. <coughs> it is in this context that I touch on North-South issues. It is not my intention to take up comprehensive North-South issues as such here. But I would like to explain how some of these issues are being tackled in developing Asia. Economic interdependence between the industrial powers of Europe, North America, and Japan has received great attention. But it is developing Asia which shows that interdependence has a significant North-South dimension and that prosperity in the North is not possible without prosperity in the South. In this regard, the Asian Development Bank is a good example of a joint venture between regional and non-regional countries as well as between developing and developed countries. 
the developing Asian countries have been very active in promoting measures to open their economies and in resorting to market mechanism rather than relying on centralized control. Rapid economic growth in Asia and its comparatively low debt are proof of the success of the policies being pursued there. I believe Asia is a good model for solving many of the North-South problems associated with economic interdependence. For this reason, it is vitally important for the United States and other industrialized countries to support Asia in its effort to maintain its momentum for development. I'd first take up the problem of accumulated external debt, which has drawn worldwide attention since the international financial crisis erupted a year ago. Today, the external debt of developing countries is nearly $700 billion. This staggering sum is concentrated in a small number of large developing countries, mostly in Latin America. Credit crises in Mexico and Brazil were, at the time, diffused through the combined efforts of the international community, the IMF, commercial banks, and major industrialized countries. What I have been most concerned about since August last year is whether a financial crisis might not break out in Asia. Because once a financial crisis occurs, it will take at least four to five years to repair the damage and bring the countries back to their normal course of growth. Asian developing countries so far have been able to avoid financial crises mainly because of judicious development strategies and sound domestic policies. These policies have usually been consistent with the approaches supported by the IMF. For example, many have undertaken economic adjustment measures at an early stage when their balance of payments worsened. Many have made structural reforms to liberalize imports and foreign exchange controls, and they have opened their doors to more foreign investment. A good indication of the judicious policies of the economies of Asia is that they have drawn far more on IMF facilities than countries in Latin America, which by and large did not go to the IMF until the last moment because they did not like the conditionality attached to IMF credit. While the aversion of the policymakers to outside interference is understandable. Economic advice given by the IMF has proved to be helpful in reversing the deteriorating trend in external payments in many countries, and has also helped in shoring up the confidence of private lenders. It has often been suggested in North-South dialogues that certain external debt be rescheduled, refinanced, or even shelved automatically by some predetermined formula. Measures by the international community to ease difficulties in certain countries are necessary and must be taken, but on a case-by-case -case basis. In fact, such measures are being taken more frequently now than before. But blanket acceptance of, re of rescheduling or refinancing as a matter of course would dampen future assistance efforts in the market economies of the North, where it is understood that money borrowed must be repaid. The world economic situation and debt problems are interrelated. <clears throat> Once the global economy recovers, the exports of developing countries will revive, 
interest burdens will be reduced and the problem of external debt will become manageable. Therefore, world economic recovery is the best solution to the problem of external debt. It goes without saying that developing countries need foreign capital for growth. The solution is not to reduce external debt, but to raise productivity with borrowed funds so that countries in debt can increase exports as the world economy expands. But there is a disturbing trend in the world today, namely the emergence of new protectionism, which I will take up next. The international trade system has become increasingly open and liberal since the 1950s, and the countries of East and Southeast Asia were among those which profited from it. Institutional mechanisms such as GATT helped to encourage less restrictive trade policies, and the volume of world trade increased rapidly to the benefit of both North and South. The 60s and the 70s, currency crises and oil shocks notwithstanding, were characterized by rapid trade expansion and real economic growth, particularly in Asian developing nations. But more recently, economic stagnation and unemployment in the industrialized countries have caused many countries of the North to begin to close the door on world trade. Recent uh, pro protectionist measures in the North, which are vividly described in the recent World Economic Outlook by the IMF, include bilateral and voluntary arrangements. According to this report, these restrictive actions often form part of policies ostensibly aimed at preserving employment or profitability in import competing or export sectors and have their origin in both cyclical difficulties and long-standing structural problems affecting key economic sectors. Unfortunately, these restrictive actions often become part of national policies. Even though protectionist measures have not been deliberately aimed at the South, they have begun to spill over with damaging effects on the export of labor-intensive goods and processed raw materials. In other words, new protectionism is harming industries in which developing countries have a strong comparative advantage. For years, the industrial, industrialized nations have been strong and vigorous proponents of a liberal trade system. But it is ironic that today many Asian countries are liberalizing their trade and economic policies at the urgings of the developing countries, while developed countries are becoming much more protectionist. An open system can only exist if nations whose interest it is to trade with each other work together to achieve it. Liberalization of trade is in the common interest of both North and South. In talking about North-South trade, the problems of the primary commodities cannot be ignored. <coughs> Traditional problems associated with commodities, especially fluctuations in prices and earnings, are well known. The steep decline in commodity export prices in the past few years has led to a deterioration in the terms of trade of many developing countries. Export earnings have fallen precipitously since the world recession began. Export receipts of non-oil developing countries fell by 20 billion dollars from 1981 to 82, mainly due to lower earnings 
Roman commodity pairs. The net decline in trade balances and incomes has seriously affected the balance of payments, debt servicing capacity, and growth rates of the most developing countries. As a result, important development projects in many countries, including Asia, have been delayed or even terminated. Many attempts have been made in the past to moderate commodity price fluctuations or to finance shortfalls in incomes. I agree that commodity prices should not be stabilized at artificially high levels. But I believe that wide fluctuations in the prices of major primary commodities should be avoided, not only in the interest of developing countries for whom commodities are an important source of foreign exchange, but also for developed countries who import them. Long-term solutions will require detailed study with a view to diversify and improve the economic structure of de developing countries. Third, I would like to turn to development assistance, an area in which I am directly involved. The question of foreign aid and the role it plays in economic development has been subject to controversy now that the industrial nations are beset by huge fiscal deficits and plagued by high unemployment. It is often said that despite massive aid in the past, development programs show little evidence of success in achieving economic development and eradicating poverty. Critics of aid argue that there is no general relationship between foreign aid, domestic savings, and economic growth to support the case for more aid. Lack of absorbed capacity, poor project selection, and substitution of foreign assistance for domestic savings are often given as examples of why aid has had a minimal impact on accelerating the process of economic growth and development. This conclusion is contrary to my own view that the great bulk of aid is effective, particularly in the case of developing Asia. The rate of return on foreign aid-assisted projects is high. Its contribution to growth and development has been impressive and aid in our part of the world has a high impact on poverty. In the case of agriculture, <coughs> to which the ADB gives a great deal of attention, some former food deficit countries are now reaching self-sufficiency and in some cases have become net exporters of food grains. 10 years ago, Few people expected that this would become possible. Facts like these support my contention that aid money in Asia is usefully spent on the purposes for which it is intended. This is especially true in the case of multilateral institutions such as the Asian Development Bank where lending operations are conducted on the basis of economic considerations and cost effectiveness and are disassociated from political motives. In the past 10 years, Asia has grown quite rapidly compared with other developing areas. For some newly industrializing countries, these growth rates are unmatched anywhere in the world. The positive relationship between aid, savings, and economic growth is borne out by statistical analysis carried out by the ADB. Now I would like to talk about some main features of the Asian economy. For many years, some Americans thought the United States itself was the world, 
and that international transactions were only spin-offs of its national transactions. As a matter of fact, as late as 1960, U.S. exports of goods and services were only about 5% of its GNP. Now they are more than 11%. At the same time, America's share of the GNP of the free market economies dropped from around 45% in 1960 to 30% in 1982, reflecting more rapid growth in Europe and in Japan. Also, the U.S. trade pattern had shifted toward the south. The world is getting smaller. Europe and Japan are becoming closer to the United States. So are the countries of the south. U.S. exports of goods to developing countries are 45% today, compared to 35% in the late 1960s. I should add that U.S. trade with the Pacific nations, including developing Asia and Japan, already exceeds the level of U.S. trade with Western Europe. <coughs> Rapid economic growth in developing Asia has been accompanied by an, by an expansion of international exchange with the developed nations. Even in the turbulent period since the early 1970s, the economic performance of developing Asia has been exceptional. For example, between 1973 and 1981, real economic growth in 14 Asian developing countries averaged 6.5%, much higher than other regions. Real economic growth in 1982 fell sharply in nearly all market economies. Developing Asia countries were no exception, as real growth declined to 3.8%, reflecting the corrosive effects of the long recession. Nevertheless, Positive economic growth in developing Asia contrasts with the minus 1% rate recorded by Latin America and the negative growth rate averaged by OECD countries in 1982. Still, there are significant differences in economic performance among sub-regional groupings in Asia, particularly among the newly industrializing countries, ASEAN, and the countries of South Asia. For instance, the per capita GNP of Singapore at $5,220 in 1982 was higher than some of the OECD countries. And manufactured exports from Korea are greater than some of the OECD countries in terms of value and the percentage of total exports. It is easy to see why the Asian region, uh, as the Asian region diversifies, North-South issues assume a different emphasis. Today, most Asian mix are importers of the primary commodities. So their stand on commodity issues is necessarily different from that of their Asian neighbors who export them. As their economies develop, fiscal, monetary, and economic policies will become nearly the same as those of the OECD countries. The quasi mix are following after the mix, and so are other Asian countries. I believe it is in the interest of every country to promote this kind of evolution in the world economy. The countries of the South especially those of developing Asia, with its growing and dynamic markets, are becoming more integrated into world trade, investment, and the financial markets. They have become an important market for the exports of the OECD countries. What is needed in maintaining development momentum is a three-pronged approach. First, Protectionism must be resisted 
and the environment for trade and investment must be improved. This is the responsibility of both North and South. Second, foreign assistance by the North must be increased for reasons I mentioned earlier. Third, the South must take every effort to mobilize domestic savings for development. Eventually, this will be more important than foreign assistance, and it is a matter which the ADB is giving serious attention to. The Asian Development Bank was established as an international development finance institution to promote economic growth and cooperation in the Asia and Pacific region, and to contribute to the economic development of developing member countries individually and collectively. In nearly 17 years of operation, the bank has become a major force in fostering the development of the region through its own lending and technical assistance operations by functioning as a catalyst in mobilizing additional public and private capital for development purposes, and by supporting manpower development and giving assistance for development policy making and planning. Over the years, the ADB has adapted its policies to respond more fully to the needs of the growing member countries. The ADB has already established itself as a sound, reputable financial institution. Now it is time for us to also become a resource center for information and development strategy in Asia. This resource center concept is based on the premise that while financial assistance is invaluable in harnessing development potential, finance alone is not enough. Understanding by policymakers and the developing countries of the development process and the strategies is vitally important. From this point of view, I convened the first ADB Development Roundtable last month, inviting senior officials from large growing countries. The theme was financial policy and external debt management, which was quite timely. As a resource center, the ADB must continue to draw on the research expertise of centers of excellence around the world such as the one I find here in Cambridge. In its 70-year history, the ADB has gained a reputation as a highly efficient international development institution. It covers a wide range of activities which a national government or by that age alone cannot perform. The United States has been a strong supporter of multilateral institutions since the end of the Second World War. I sincerely hope that the United States, as the world's largest economy, does not abandon its leadership in world aid and continues to play a major role in supporting and contributing to these important institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, the world economy cannot prosper by narrow focus on the interests of one particular country or grouping of countries. The current economic recovery in the United States cannot lead to world economic prosperity unless it is accompanied by judicious policies and efforts by both developed and developing countries. The developed nations cannot ignore the tremendous poverty that afflicts developing nations. Nor can they pretend that poverty will be solved by the benign neglect inherent in reduced foreign aid. The stability and long-term growth of all developing countries is in the interest of the industrial democracies, not only in an economic sense, but also for political and strategic reasons. 
contributions of aid today will lead to world prosperity tomorrow. And the Asian Development Bank has an important role to play here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fujioka. To uh, complement our distinguished speaker, we've assembled a distinguished local Harvard audience uh, and panel. Let me begin with the university's most distinguished dean, if any dean at Harvard could be called distinguished. Okay? <laughs> the dean of the senior faculty here, Henry Rysovsky. Henry is a former chairman of the economics department and a longtime student of Japan, indeed one of the nation's leading authorities on the economy of Japan. And in addition to making some comments, he will also serve as moderator. So let me introduce the other members of the panel. Hollis Chinnery is a former professor of economics here at Harvard who's returned recently from a stint as vice president of the World Bank for Development. So he, Hollis has worked uh, in the past with the Asia Development Bank and I think will bring a special perspective to these issues. Hollis will be followed by Ray Vernon, who is the Dillon Professor of International Affairs here at Harvard and a professor at the Kennedy School. He has been a, he's a former professor of the business school and also a former director of Harvard's Center for International Affairs, who's recently published a book entitled Two Hungry Giants, The U.S. and Japan in the Quest for Oil and Ores. The cleanup hitter tonight is uh, Ezra Vogel, a professor of sociology and also the Edwin Reischauer Research Professor in Japanese Studies. Ezra is known both in this country and in Japan as the author of Japan is number one, a critical admiration of the Japanese economy, and as the co-chairman of a faculty seminar here on industrial policy at the school, he's now doing a study of comparative industrial policy in the U.S. and Japan. So, the panel. Henry Rosofsky. Ladies and gentlemen, I am going to take advantage of uh, being the moderator and uh, select the speakers in my order. And I always prefer to go last uh, because uh, perhaps I will get some additional inspiration from the other speakers. I notice that uh, all of the panelists were introduced as former something or other, <laughs> which is interesting, and that uh, Ezra Vogel's book was given by the incorrect title. It is not Japan is number one, but Japan as number one, which is a very subtle <laughs> distinction. But before getting on to that, uh, why don't we lead off with uh, Hollis Chenery, and uh, we'll then go on in that order. I'll ask Ray after that, and then Ezra, and uh, perhaps I might add something before taking questions. I would like the distinguished panelists to confine themselves to five minutes, if that's possible. Everything is possible, sir. <clears throat> I will leave out half of what I was planning to say, because mostly I agree with the general diagnosis. And rather than repeat what uh, has already been said, I would like to see what we might learn from the Asian experience, uh, both for other developing countries and for other aspects of world development. Now, if we, you have heard mainly about the experience of East Asian countries. The Asia, of course, has two other large countries, China and India, which have had a very different experience. Uh, and if we were talking about developing Asia, literally, we would have to incorporate some of their experience, which is, I would say, in most respects, the opposite. They have been inward looking, closed economies and have suffered considerably from doing that. So one would draw somewhat similar conclusions about the virtues of being outward looking and trading with the rest of the world. But all, the only point I'm making is that Asia includes the whole range of development experience and there are very few f factors which one would say apply to all Asian countries. I think there, there may be a couple. From the World Bank's point of view, uh, the diagnosis 
based on the experience of East Asia, uh, taking the world as a whole would stand up pretty well. In other words, taking the last 20 years from 1960 to the, the present, and if we look at what kinds of successes there have been, the most notable group of successful countries have been the ones which in the bank we call the Gang of Four. Uh, they're all East Asian countries, uh, Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Uh, those in population together are only about 50 million people. They do about 60 or 70 percent of the exports of all developing countries. Taiwan alone exports about as much as all of China, and those four countries together expo export much more than, than all of the Latin American NICs and so forth. And many of the differences, the debt problems are in Latin America but not in East Asia because Latin Americans by and large are not too very successful exporters. They have overvalued exchange rates. They believe in protecting their domestic industries. And while Brazil had a brief period of opening up, uh, it was nothing like what Korea and Taiwan and, and other, even Malaysia and, and the Philippines have done better. So the, the debt problem and success in internal performance are very closely related. And if we look at the rest of the world, we find that these few Asian countries stand out, not all. Now, if we try to say why, how did this happen, I'm reminded of uh, Professor Reichauer's answer to the question of why Japan was so successful in the last 30 years. Uh, it had the advantage of having no raw materials, of having its industrial establishment more or less wiped out during the war, and essentially of having to start over again. Uh, the result has been a stress on exporting because there were no alternatives. You could not export oil or other things, so it had to learn to become an industrial exporter. Similarly, it had to stress human resources, not physical resources. And that, by and large, is in capsule form the diagnosis of most of the successful Asian countries. They have, fortunately, for different cultural reasons, a strong emphasis in their in their cultures on education, so that the ability to get skilled workers at relatively cheap prices is what underlies much of this performance. And that is a lesson which can be learned, but it's hard, even if you understand it, it's very hard to say, well, all right, now Chad or Upper Volta, you follow what Korea did, because Korea had 50 years, and so did Taiwan and so forth, of educational training behind it whereas the colonial powers in Africa did not leave that, that kind of legacy. And it's rather a cheap shot to say, why don't you do what some of the East Asian countries have done? They've built on a cultural heritage. Uh, since I'm in danger of using all my five minutes on that point, I'll make two others. Um, in terms of the interdependence of the developing countries and the advanced countries, the Asian countries we've been talking about are the extremes. Essentially, the Western world had to absorb the emergence of Japan in the 50s and 60s as a very successful exporter, which essentially outperformed the OECD countries and has taken over a variety of markets. Now, the prospect of continued success of the East Asian model is that there will be another Japan to be absorbed in the next 15, 20 years. Uh, and this means that while trade is to the benefit of everybody, if it is everybody adjusts to it, the adjusting by getting out of industries which we're quite comfortable in is quite difficult. It may be, in retrospect, much harder to get out of the old industries than it was to establish the new industries. So it is quite true that most of my colleagues in the economics department will preach the virtues of free trade and comparative advantage, but one should not underestimate the difficulties of moving out. And the success of the East Asian countries, particularly since they are by far the most important group of the so-called NICs, uh, if it's pushed uh, without some adjustment and understanding of the problems of adjustment by the advanced countries, I think it can very well boomerang, that the idea of industrial policy may well be distorted into something which justifies protection 
and there's a particularly favorable period in these countries in which the cost of labor has not caught up with the productivity of labor, which they are now in, and which we no longer have. So while I agree with the general thrust, I would stress some of the difficulties. And finally, in terms of the lessons of Asia, the other one I would point to is that they are, among these countries, are also probably the most efficient users of foreign assistance. If you want examples at the project level of things that work, you can find them not only in the countries we've been talking about, but also in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and many other Asian countries. And the failures of, in Africa, say, which is the most notable location of failures, is because of the lack of educated manpower, uh, motivation, etc., which came from some earlier period, but certainly is not a, a, a result of economic policy. So I think it's, it's useful to stress the successes. One should not underestimate the, what went behind them and that these are old civilizations which are making use of some of their heritage. Ray? Okay. I find uh, Mr. Fujioka's appearance here before us tonight particularly apt as the head of, a, of an important regional development bank, apt because on some speculation about the present situation of, uh, of international political affairs, he, it may be that he represents, in a certain sense, the institution of the future. Let me elaborate on what I mean by this uh, statement. First of all, uh, he pointed out to us that the length of the crisis that we confront in uh, international liquidity, international financial intermediaries, and the problem of the financing uh, of the, the, the continuation of the development process is not a short-term crisis. It's a rather long-term one. I think he used notions such as five years. I, uh, I suspect that would be a somewhat optimistic uh, estimate of the length of time through which we will be uh, seized of these problems as acute problems. Second of all, his observations that U.S. interests are deeply intertwined with the future development of these developing countries. Uh, represent a kind of realism and wisdom that I think we have to be constantly reminded of. But there is a third uh, pr realistic proposition that one must confront, especially uh, in, uh, in the context of the ARCO Forum and the Kennedy School, and that is the brutal political probability, I would almost say reality, that uh, U.S. support for global institutions is not increasing. Uh, one might say is declining, and on any uh, estimate of the outcome of the next election uh, is unlikely suddenly to rise again within this very period of crisis. Now, uh, it pays to dwell for just uh, 30 seconds on the reasons for this uh, that may necessarily speculative, but they uh, to the extent that one can detect them, they are reasons of a long-term character. The sense of the part of the United States that it is in some sense not the leader of these institutions to the same degree as in the past. The uh, 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 increased political uh, weight of the LDCs, at least the numbers in many of these institutions. And in a certain sense, the remoteness of the problems when viewed in the abstract, developing countries as a whole, from the American political process. On the other hand, there is um, a recognition which is growing and is widespread among the leadership of the United States of the fact that the U.S. economy is inextricably intertwined with global development in a sense that never previously existed in the, United, in the, uh, in the course of U.S. economic history. And that point was, uh, was made by Mr. Fujioka very well. And confronted with this dilemma, this clash of attitudes and forces, one of the questions is, uh, what is it that's likely to emerge? One possibility, of course, is that as Americans and perhaps other countries 
grope for dealing with this conflict with their sense of uh, a desire not to support these remote global institutions, but on the other hand, a desire to deal with their intimate interrelationships with the rest of the world, that they will look to smaller and more immediate institutions in which they have a, uh, a sense of connection, uh, th uh, such as, for example, the various regional banks of the world. They may be pushed in this direction also by the recognition of the widening differences in the nature of the problems of the different regions. Uh, we heard something about the abundance of, uh, of the developing countries in Asia as compared to the uh, much more difficult problems of the Africans and the still third characteristic, uh, a group of problems among the LDCs. And it is, uh, what one hears sort of overtones of this almost in the asides of international uh, diplomacy, a proposal for a Caribbean uh, initiative, which would, would have been unlikely coming from the Americans four or five years ago. Vague talk about Pacific Basin relationships, mostly empty talk, but on the other hand, the reflection of a kind of preoccupation with getting closer to the, the other side of the problem, if you like. Um, and then the reality of, of various regional movements such as Lomé and others. All of this, to me, adds up to the possibility that uh, Mr. Fujioka may find himself in an enlarged role responding to the very problems that he is that he has uh, uh, adumbrated, suggested to us tonight, a role in which smaller institutions more explicitly targeted at specific problems in different parts of the world come to play a, a very much larger role. And that, in turn, will depend on the kinds of initiatives that men like Mr. Fujioka bring to the problem, men and women like Mr. Fujioka bring to the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. I'd like to also to address myself to the question that Ray Vernon raised, and that is uh, the question of cooperative relationships uh, between Japan and other countries for dealing with world problems. Uh, I think that uh, the Asian Development Bank is really one of the most successful cases we have thus far, although Mr. Fujioka, Fujioka was quite modest in talking about it, where Japan has really taken great initiative, and while other countries like the United States have played a major role, uh, certainly in recent years, the financing is very heavily from Japan, and it's an example of the kind of constructive role that Japan can play in, in international relations that require multilateral relations and multilateral organizations. <clears throat> I think one of the questions as we think about the shape of the world and the United States, think about the implications of the United States not dominating world trade and world GNP the way it used to, uh, is of course that we have to cooperate much more with other countries and much more closely and conversely that countries like Japan which now have a, a, an increasing role of the world GNP will have to take a major role and having just returned from a year in Japan I thought I would make a few comments about my impressions of the mood in Japan about taking this expanded role. <clears throat> I, I see a great deal of conflicts in Japan over this expanded role just to give you some examples in, 1980, in 1981, when the Jap Japan was starting the fifth generation computer project, they had an international world con congress uh, and advocated that this would be a project that not only Japan, but many other researchers from many other countries would take part. That was an extraordinary initiative and in and, and all the large research projects in computers, uh, they had never done this. Uh, however, by now, uh, still no uh, foreigners are taking part and in, there has been a slight backtracking uh, in this particular case where the Japanese are saying, well, we will now exchange results of what we have done in the fifth generation project with people who have done other uh, pro similar projects abroad and we will welcome international conferences to discuss these issues, uh, which is quite a bit of difference. I think gives some indication of the difficulty of certain uh, progressive groups in Japan as represented by uh, institutions like the Asian Development Bank that are trying to take initiatives and that yet don't have full support of all the actors uh, in the scene within Japan. Uh, one of the problems, of course, is as trade frictions arise uh, abroad uh, and uh, these are filtered through the Japanese press and Japanese media, uh, other Japanese media, one gets often a stronger nationalistic uh, uh, 
twist on the ball so that uh, Japan comes out saying we have to, uh, to fight and stand up and take more independent role uh, as, a re as a result of uh, the kind of reactions that you have now in the United States uh, and, and Western Europe. Uh, so that there, there is a, a, a growing nationalism in certain circles, and that one finds, particularly in the press and the media, uh, a, an increased determination in areas like high technology uh, to go it alone. Now, that's one side of the thing. The other side of the thing, which I find the most hopeful development in Japan, is the increasing recognition that the world order is somewhat fragile and that uh, Japan is going to have to play its role in, in, in taking part of keeping together this fragile world order. Uh, if I could s oversimplify the reaction of Japan during the hundred, last hundred years, it might be that, that, that how do you catch up the world levels? How does Japan, from a position of being far behind, make use of the international situation to strengthen uh, Japan and to raise it to uh, international levels in the economy in all areas of life. Uh, it's just in the last couple of years that one senses in a lot of leading circles in Japan now uh, real concern that Japanese prosperity cannot really stand alone. They cannot assume that America will automatically uh, handle all problems. Uh, and uh, a lot of ideas that one would have not have heard even three years ago in Japanese circles, you can find now people saying, all right, what are we going to do about the North-South debt problem? This is obviously too serious to the international order. It, it's going to have a tremendous impact on Japan, and we have to play a major role in solving that problem of North-South debt. Now, again, uh, this has not penetrated to all circles, but among opinion leaders in government, business, newspapers, uh, think tanks, there has been a remarkable change of mood and a, a remarkable recognition of this. And I, I think that one can therefore hope that within the next several years, there will be increased attention uh, to this problem, increasing efforts like the Asian Development Bank in a whole broad range of fields. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, the leaders of this movement who take part in international conferences, uh, the most cosmopolitan of the group will be out there in front and they will be advocating and making encouraging sounds, and in the end, Japan will not be able to move quite as rapidly as some of these people wanted, but still, I think over the long haul, the direction will certainly be a, a very greatly increased Japanese role uh, in these institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as I listened to the panelists, I was struck by this, the notion, I used to know Ezra Vogel when he was a sociologist, and now he sounds like Otto Eckstein. I don't know <laughs> what, uh, uh, furthermore, I am embarrassed because every interesting comment that I had intended to make has been made by the distinguished panelists. So I think the sooner I throw this open for questions, the better. Let me just though say a couple of words. Um, as I was listening to Mr. Fujioka's very interesting presentation, I was really asking myself whether Asia was, was a unit at all in any meaningful sense. I think Hollis has made the same point. Let me give you an example. He said that uh, Asia, uh, what is needed in, the de in developing Asia is to resist protectionism increased foreign assistance and mobilization of domestic savings. I said to myself, what a marvelous description of what is needed in the United States. Uh, we may not need increased foreign assistance, but we could certainly use foreign capital, and we certainly need to mobilize domestic savings for investment. Uh, you also wonder, really, about, I am not very optimistic about the validity of the East Asian experience in general for all the reasons that have been given. In fact, even within the ADB region, uh, of course, there are NICs, there are countries that have not done very well, there, there are countries that are unstable. What I am struck by is, I don't know, you may call it the Gang of Four, I think the Gang of Four can be enlarged. It is essentially the Chinese culture area that we're talking about. The area that goes from Japan in the east to Vietnam in the west, 
that the People's Republic may join if it adopts sensible economic policies, and that is a question, but that is really the area that we're talking about. And when one looks at some of the other countries in the area, the problems may rather more closely approach, in some instances, those of Latin America and perhaps even those of Africa, and I'm not at all sure that, uh, that we have uh, all of the answers, although I recognize that the Asian region in general has done much better. I'm struck also by, um, I'm in a sense underlining what some of my fellow panelists said, by the key issue of restructuring in, uh, in what you might call the North. And I wanted to throw out, you know, what is perhaps a wild idea, but uh, one that I've been thinking about more and more. Uh, if the current age of computers, which is essentially the age of artificial intent intelligence, is going to create a revolution in the world that may have, may perhaps have an impact like the Industrial Revolution of the 1780s or the one of the second half of the 19th century, we could really face a situation that uh, would create enormous difficulties for the developing world because it is possible under those circumstances for the advantages of cheap labor really to become much less meaningful and we wonder what that impact would have. It would be very difficult within the advanced countries, within the northern countries so-called, to engage in this restructuring, but it may be becoming even more difficult as we try and adapt ourselves to this technology of enormously wide implication. I think that the key relationship and e even from the point of view of developing Asia, is the U.S.-Japanese relationship. I think that's what Ezra was saying, too, because uh, the problems of protectionism will not be solved outside of the uh, U.S.-Japanese context. And there, uh, you know, I think it is difficult to be very optimistic in the short run, although I still hope that uh, that good sense will prevail. One last point. It has been mentioned too, but perhaps not as strongly as one should. It seems to me that the international system has broken down. Uh, you know, the system, the Bretton Woods system, I suppose it is, uh, is really no longer functioning properly. What does that imply for the North-South problem? Uh, is there today in these sort of sad times, economic times, it is marvelous to hear an envoy from developing Asia, which is the one part of the world that has really done so much better than all the other parts of the world. And even though I've ex expressed some pessimism, I very much hope I'm wrong and that it, this is a lesson for other parts of the world. I would like now to take questions, if I may. Uh, yes, sir. I'm delighted that I could call on you first because I was specifically instructed to take somebody in the upper levels. <laughs> yes, and I was specifically asked to sit there so you could take me. Good. <laughs> Mr. So Mr. you're a plant. <laughs> That's right. Uh, Mr. Fujioka, the question is really for you, and it's uh, echoing what the last speaker just mentioned, and it's a lot to do with uh, the Bretton Woods system breaking down. Uh, I really do believe the Bretton Woods system has broken down, and aiding or giving aid to the third world or financing, etc., is going to try and prop the Bretton Woods again, waiting for the OECD countries to go into another uh, sort of dip or recession. So my question is, what sort of uh, restructuring has your bank, or the regional bank, proposed to insulate the third world or insulate the developing countries from the effects of uh, the recession, say, in OECD countries? Well, I, uh, I agree with you that uh, the uh, unitary worldwide system has broken down since the collapse of the Bretton Woods system in the early 1970s. Uh, we are protecting each other uh, ourselves, and one way to get out of this dilemma is to to strengthen the regional cooperation. But this is only possible uh, when the, uh, there exists a number of similar countries 
uh, like, like ASEAN or European community, but not uh, for the region uh, in Asia as a whole. Uh, therefore, the lack of perfect international system must be uh, supplemented by case-by-case -case cooperation, which we are now conducting, uh, such as the summit meeting in Williams Park, or uh, single summit meeting which started seven years ago, or at the international conference like the World Bank and IMF we just had uh, last week. So this painful you know, effort must continue. Thank you. Uh, is there, do I see any other questions? Would the other panelists perhaps like to comment on this? Uh, I'm yes, yes, please. Oh, another. Uh, thank you. Uh, the, my question is really general and it relates not only to Asia but also to other developing countries, Africa uh, in particular. One hears that uh, these days the uh, virtue of development is export-led and every developing world uh, country uh, is being exhorted to export more and more and I'm wondering about the realism of that strategy. Thank you very much. Uh, who wants to uh, call us? Well, I agree with your skepticism. I think that uh, statistically, if you pick out a couple of variables and say we see an association between export-led policies and successful growth, if there are other factors which are associated with those same variables, then you're including the effects of the other factors. And I think that is what has happened in being impressed with East Asia. There are many other things besides the fact that they have had relatively realistic exchange rates and, and developed competitive exports, which are not, I don't think it could be transferred at all literally to Africa. It could be transferred more, more literally to Latin America. But if we look at specifically at Africa, the, I would say that some some part of the policy should be a shift away from uh, inward-looking protection, uh, but the just shifting to exports without doing a lot of other things is not going to be effective. And therefore, the, the, it's a sort of a cheap way of getting out of uh, the need for a long-term aid, education, cooperation policy to say, well, just follow what a Korea did and, and you won't need our aid. That's, that's not true. Right. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Kujoka, please. Uh, well, I, I was reminded by uh, Professor Chen's remark, previous remark, that uh, um, while I advocated the open market approach, uh, I didn't uh, include uh, in my contention uh, India and China. Uh, India is not borrowing from the ADB, and China is not a member as yet. Uh, therefore, my argument is uh, valid as of today. <laughs> and, uh, as uh, the chairman said, uh, validity, validity of East Asian example uh, may not be applicable to other countries. And uh, when the situation changes, and uh, if I'm invited again, I'll make another speech. <laughs> <laughs> right. Let me. Uh, uh, try to make a distinction between export-led growth as it's sometimes uh, referred to in uh, macroeconomic analysis uh, and export-led growth in a sense that uh, gets a lot closer to uh, Ezra's specialty, that of sort of uh, anthropology, sociology, and its relation to politics. Uh, it's perfectly obvious that uh, all countries cannot have an export balance. So exhorting all countries to have uh, export-led growth in the sense their exports should exceed their imports is an interesting exercise in frustration unless uh, <laughs> someone is prepared to cut down on, uh, someone is somehow prepared to accept the imbalance of results. The implications of this strategy of export-led growth 
go way beyond the balance of payments. What, in effect, is being uh, sometimes said when the phrase is used is, there's a great world out there. It's uh, full of possibilities for technological absorption, which will require you, in turn, to get in touch with it, and will require you also to find opportunities in markets that you may not be aware of at the present time. In short, uh, we'll require you to, to uh, begin to trade not only in ways that are internal to your own country, but also in ways that exploit the opportunities for bargains externally. That need not lead to an export balance. It, it can thoroughly avoid the, uh, the dilemma that uh, all countries uh, uh, cannot have a, uh, at the same time an export balance, while at the same time enormously stimulating the growth of the country. One of the uh, remarkable as aspects of, uh, of post-Meiji Japanese development was this extraordinary, persistent reaching out for the purpose of absorbing technology from, um, from other countries, a policy which in turn required a certain amount of exports for its execution. Uh, it had to finance uh, the import of foreign specialists, foreign information, trips abroad for young Japanese to spend five or ten years in foreign countries. Because development banks were not available. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here we had export-led growth in a sense, but it was it, one can describe it also as technology import-led growth, if you like, more contact-led growth. And that, I think, is feasible for Africa as it is for any other part of the world. Thank you. Yes, sir. You mean a world, a world bank? No, I'm, I'm focusing on oh, the regional bank. Oh, you're asking the wrong question. I mean, uh, I'm not going to touch that question, but I think the answer is obviously uh, yes, because you've described uh, one of the great regional development banks. Uh, I must say, uh, one of the things that has uh, interested me you know, uh, is the um, I think that the Asian Development Bank should do more research. And I think that uh, you have indicated an interest in, um, in doing that. And I've always felt that it should particularly do research in, um, in those countries that were not doing well uh, within the region to try and get at some of those very difficult so social and cultural factors. Uh, you know, I had a sort of a pet idea that uh, when you look at the gang of four or at the successful cases in Asia, you've got to come to the conclusion, I think, that those countries, uh, you know, I don't think it's because the Japanese lost World War II or a lot of those other reasons that they, they're part, partial explanation, but I always thought that the key answer was that Japan was able to use a lot of its traditional strengths for purposes of modernization. That's not putting it very well, but I, I think that that more than anything else explains the key of Japanese economic success. And I think even China, if you, you know, whether you consider it a success or not, if China has gotten as far as it has, it is also because, let us say, the People's Republic regime has been able to take over a society that contains a great deal of, uh, of strength in the organizational and other senses. And I th thought that a very interesting thing was to see, to look, for example, at the Philippines or Indonesia or other countries in the region from that point of view, to see whether there were not sort of uh, things that one could capture in those countries that reflect traditional values in society that can be, in a sense, used for purposes of, uh, of modernization. Now, in that sense, of course, these, uh, I think these, uh, although I don't think that bankers like to think this way, I mean, I think that, um, and I can understand why, because these research projects are 
tricky and uh, I think they may not get one very far. There's a lot of disappointment. But I think in that sense, certainly these regional banks make a, a great deal of uh, sense. And I think the Asian Development has Bank has been a great success, even without that. I just add a footnote to that research problem. One of the most interesting cases now might be Malaysia, because mm -hmm. Malaysia is a country that was not really a, quite such a part of this East Asian cultural tradition, mm -hmm. and is now consciously studying the organization, the infrastructure, the education, and so forth of the East Asian group, cultural group, to see whether they could copy it. And I think that case uh, is found to be a very interesting one. Uh, yes, a uh, person in the corner up there. Uh, this question is directed to Mr. Vogel or uh, Mr. Fujioka. I think until recently a lot of uh, Japan's assistance to its Asian neighbors has been seen as self-serving. I think that attitude has been changed by uh, Mr. Nakasone's uh, trip throughout Asia recently. Uh, given Mr. Vernon's point, that uh, the United States policy of lending has changed with the onset of the Reagan administration, giving the Lockheed trial verdict coming out this fall and uh, Mr. Nakasone's somewhat uh, perhaps shaky political future. I wonder how much of this is in fact, Japan's new emphasis is in fact related to Mr. Nakasone and if he does leave, can we expect Japan to continue that dedication in the future? Professor Vogel is an expert on Japan. I'm not a neutral international person as an international institution. An expert, uh, expert, of course, the one who claims and pretends to know, uh, and I would like to think I'm not an expert in that sense, but I, I would be happy to, uh, to offer my uh, impressions and opinions. Um, I think that, uh, of course, foreign aid always involves some uh, pursuit of self-interest, and I think uh, within Japan, there is always a calculation of what this is going to do for Japanese business and which particular industries and uh, in which particular way. I mean, the Japanese, for example, assume that America is using its defense spending in order to help certain industries to help our competitive position because that's exactly the way they would do things. I, w I wish I could say that that were really the case in the United States. And I think in terms of uh, foreign aid, there are also some of these same considerations. There are Japanese who are involved uh, who think precisely how these uh, questions of aid uh, will uh, assist you know, Japanese economic penetration. I think in the 1950s when Japan uh, began to pay reparations to Asian countries, the, the payment of reparations, the timing and the focus was such that it was stimulating certain kinds of Japanese exports. I don't think that has died down uh, entirely, but I, I do think that Nakasone represents in a way kind of a new stage uh, of sensitivity to Asian uh, problems. Uh, I, I don't think that it's, it's uniquely Nakasone. I think if you trace, say, the comparison from Tanaka's visit to Southeast Asia and compare that with Kuda's visit, uh, Kuda was uh, really made uh, very serious efforts to make uh, donations to Asia. I think in a way Nakasone has simply carried that one step further. So I, I don't think that Nakasone is unique. I think that there are uh, an, any number of, of Japanese who would like to, to uh, play a much bigger role uh, and a positive role in development of, of Southeast Asia. And yet uh, within Japan, the efforts to bring Southeast Asians to Japan has been a very frustrating one for many people. Uh, I think many of the Southeast Asians brought to Japan still feel there is a very considerable prejudice in Japan against Southeast Asians. Uh, and many of the Japanese who want to promote more cooperation uh, feel that it's very difficult to promote as much cooperation, not just because of memories of World War II, but because of still very deep attitudes uh, within Japan. So I think there will be continued development, but it's not simple unilinear uh, growth. Well, I think the danger, if I may just say a word about that question, is that if uh, 
the world becomes more protectionist, I think one possibility that free trader is at the microphone there. Uh, one possibility is that the world will break up into trading blocks. And uh, this is high tech. <laughs> I think uh, we'll take another question. Yes, uh, gentleman in the back, please. Uh, as you know, the the current uh, aid fatigue in uh, uh, some advanced countries comes from the fact that uh, aid, aid money has not been utilized very well. I realized this uh, uh, shortcoming of the user of foreign aid. Uh, and now we are faced with uh, financial constraints. And only feasible approach for us to give greater impact on the economic development of this region is to make fuller and better use of limited uh, fund. How do we achieve this? As I said uh, in my presentation, it's very important that uh, policy makers of the borrowing countries who are the users of the fund should have a correct understanding of the development process and problems so that the money can be used to the maximum extent. That's what I mean by resource center. By resource center, we shall <coughs> make uh, more intense research on the development issues and disseminate knowledge to the borrowing countries and help them utilize the funds more efficiently. Uh, I, I couldn't find a better word, and uh, I just borrowed uh, some of the said resource center as a convenient English. But this is the purpose for which the bank was created. As I said, we are now a very strong, fast-rate uh, financial bank. But on top of that, we must perform a useful <laughs> development function. Yes. Uh, this will be the uh, last question. Yes. Thank you very much. I anticipated this question. <laughs> All you have to say is no. <laughs> and uh, uh, Mr. Mason suggested me that uh, I should follow the suit of the President Truman. That is, I say, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I want to be uh, more polite. Uh, <laughs> I think the problem is uh, a very highly uh, domestic political issue. And uh, as uh, an uh, international civil servant, I'm supposed not to comment on the political issue of individual countries. But I agree that uh, this has a great bearing impact on the economic and the financial uh, side. And I'm very much concerned about this. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to... Uh, Thank Mr. Fujioka for his uh, excellent and uh, hopeful <laughs> message. To thank my distinguished colleagues uh, for their contributions. To thank you for your question. The Kennedy School for its hospitality and all of you for coming. Thank you very much.